Uh, good morning. Michelle has suggested that we that we start that we that we get started and maybe just chat for a bit and other people might trickle in. Um, so since since we're a small group, maybe we should just chit chat for a bit and and uh, and have everyone introduce each other and then and then see where this goes. I know that uh, Dr. Murthy has has placed an introduction in the chat since since your um, audio is not since your microphone is not working and I'm wondering if uh, I see George McInnes maybe if we can just maybe if each you could also do a quick introduction and then we can think about what's worth talking about. I'll mute myself. Um, so hi, I'm um, I'm the uh, UK sponsor for the UK part of the Catalyst Award. So George Mears, I'm uh, and what's called the Challenge Director for Healthy Aging for the UK's Healthy Aging Program, um, mm -hmm. of which the Catalyst Awards are are part of an overall sort of um, initiative that um, we're doing. Um, I, I joined this group because the research that I fund separate to the Catalyst Awards um, uh, may surprise some people, but is, is, is focused on social, behavioural and design aspects of mm. ageing. Um, that's not to say there isn't a, a fairly healthy programme of biomedical research um, in the UK. And indeed, today I've just seen that um, we, we've launched um, some engineering research related to uh, aging and, and homes, uh, but we particularly wanted to focus on the uh, the, the, the question of, of uh, given that we've been investing in aging products for probably two decades or more, why have so few actually been adopted and spread? Um, mm. And um, why are they not having the impact that we would expect? And 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 that's that's where this comes in so getting mm. a better understanding of what people want rather than what people need and um and and also how they want to receive those um those services so it's a real focus not so much on product but actually on the overall experience within which an innovation mm. is is delivered into the outside world so so that's mm. sort of um the sort of philosophy that i've come from Okay, great. Um, and and we do have um, and, and just just for um, those of you who might have joined late, um, I'll read Dr. Murthy's um, introduction as well, which um, said his his uh, microphone is not functioning, so he'll share through the chat chat. His interest is in developing spirituality-based interventions to make sense of aging in general and loneliness in particular. He's a psychiatrist from Bangalore, India. And one of the challenges of old age is making meaning out of the losses of professional, personal, and social lives. And this leads to this leads to loneliness, which, as shared in the morning session, facilitates aging and mortality. Could we use, especially in Eastern cultures, the rich resource of spiritual ways of making meaning to fight loneliness? That's the area of of interest. And um, and I'm wondering, um, maybe also um, uh, Bawi Manglian, if 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 you could perhaps um, give you a quick give us a quick introduction so that we can just get a sense of of the range of of uh, perspectives in in the room that's if that would work um i don't i don't know if that if that went through um so yeah let's I mean, I can I can tell you a little bit of uh, of of where I'm coming from, and then maybe we can think about about the basis on which to to have this conversation. And uh, 
and there are two rather rather different sets of stakes or investments in the room so we'll have to see if and how if and how we can we can bridge those um and i'm very happy to be um participating in this conversation but but i'm utterly unqualified to do so so i think i think both of you are going to to be severely disappointed on multiple fronts um but uh, uh in that in that uh, i don't work on aging at all um and and i think i'm here you know primarily as um a social scientist who has studied um science and technology and um and global biomedicine in order to you know maybe put a few considerations on the table that that might um george also speak to to some of your questions about about service delivery i don't know if i have answers to those but i can perhaps restate those questions so that so that we can have a shared dilemma on the table and um, and and think through them so so maybe i'll just say a couple of things about about my um trajectory and then a couple of things that that are on the table and uh, you know i don't know that i'm qualified at all to talk about about the spirituality question but but it would certainly be something that that i'd be very happy to hear about and respond to um if that would work so um so maybe i'll just say a couple of of things and then and then stop and open it up and and uh, you all can take it wherever wherever it's useful to go um and i was trained as as a biologist uh many years ago decades ago in fact um uh did did some basic developmental biology on slime mold which the stretch of imagination could be considered aging research but but it it, it wasn't really um and um and didn't like lab work and so i ended up in the social sciences and i ended up um uh doing a phd in a field called uh science technology and society this kind of a history and social studies of science um field and kind of fell backwards into into anthropology in that my teachers were anthropologists i learned how to do ethnographic research and um and and i kind of fell backwards into into anthropology and and one of the things that probably bears mentioning is um in terms of background is that the sort of you know intellectual milieu out of which i was formed as a biologist in india which is where i studied at first was at that time in the late 80s and early 90s quite sharply defined by the effects of what are known as people's health and people's science movements and these were community health movements very much bottom up that that started in the 19 in the late 1970s and are still quite important in terms of the landscape of community health in india that that really did push for um a broader more accessible more equitable public health and and that sort of existed alongside um a much more recent embrace of and and it came very much out of a state socialist context it came very much out of you know um and a developmentalist model a post independence developmentalist policy model and it sort of persisted through a 20 or 30 year more recent history in india that has been much more geared towards an embrace of the global market and has seen an enormous amount of of infrastructure building for innovation whatever that might mean right and i think that's still a little bit contested and fluid in in the indian context and so so um across my work my first project looked at the human genome project and corporate genomics and looked at that from the perspective not just of what was happening in the US around the time to sequence the human genome but also what was happening in India which was very much um happening 
in the register of the establishment of a so-called culture of innovation. And so, so it was, you know, how, how do we build an innovative culture for genome science and genome research? I've then studied some of the politics of global pharmaceuticals in India, and a lot of that politics had to do with access to essential medicines. And, and this involved negotiating uh, new patent regimes because around the mid 2000s, India became signatory to the WTO and had to change from an earlier process patent regime to a product patent regime. So it raised some serious questions and concerns about, about the accessibility of, of new drugs, new therapeutics, and led to a very interesting um, set of politics, a lot of which played out through the courts, actually. Um, alongside, I was following the establishment of India's first biomedical translational research institute, which was also a very interesting um, experiment in institutionalizing what translation would mean. And, and, and George, there might be some relevance there for some of your concerns as well about service delivery. And then more recently, um, all of my research has actually been in South Africa and looking at some of the, the politics of, um, of health there, because South Africa, unlike India, and certainly unlike the United States, has a constitutionally guaranteed uh, fundamental right to health. And so, so what that means, and, and some of the, the questions and politics around service delivery, when, when the constitution guarantees a right to health care, are extremely acute in, in a South African context. So, uh, so that's kind of the trajectory. I've not worked on, on aging per se, but, but some, of these, some of these lines of inquiry really raise questions for me about you know, what the relationship is between innovation and the policy response. How do we think about that? And how do we think about it? And, and this might be relevant also to the spirituality question. How do we think about it in the context of different political cultures, um, different institutional and political cultures where, where some of the, the terms that we take for granted in say an American context might mean something quite different out of, out of other histories and, and contexts. Um, so maybe I can leave it at that in terms of, of an introduction and just, just see where, where we want to, to go. Maybe I'll add one more thing, which is not at all you know, from this intellectual trajectory, but is, is a sort of personal issue that myself and a lot of people of my generation in the US and probably in the UK and elsewhere are facing, which is that certainly in our class position, in a middle class position, um, you have a whole generation of, of children who have moved out of India to study and make lives elsewhere, uh, mainly in the US, but also in other countries. And you have a generation now of an aging population without back, back home without an infrastructure of care because that infrastructure of care earlier used to be family structures and often joint family structures. And I think that that's already being, had been acutely felt and in the pandemic has been extremely acutely felt. So, so there are also, you know, some of these questions of, of what does it mean to to think about social infrastructures and transnational social infrastructures for care. And this is where also some of these questions of, um, of loneliness, of other kinds of cultural influences and importance and so on might come in. But maybe I'll leave it at that and then. Gosh, there's a um, huge amount to unpack there. Um, but. I I think actually quite a lot of common ground and and mm. you don't need to have the tag of aging to actually pick up on a lot of those common issues that you were there but let, let me just start with the, the last thing that you mentioned um, that uh, India is now moving from 
um, a, a family intergenerational living mode of where people will grow old to increasingly distant carers and distant relatives. Because I think the UK has been there for some time. I think the US is um, yeah. um, very, very similar in that, in that regard. One of the, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit from, uh, from personal experience. I know that's not very good in research terms, but <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that COVID has done in the UK is really highlighted the vulnerability. In fact, not just the UK, Italy, Spain, um, almost everywhere, the vulnerability of um, care homes as, um, let me call it uncharitably, parking lots for older people. Mm. Um, because the virus has ripped through those uh, environments really fast. Now, my own mother has been living in, in, in that, and not only has uh, and she's not been affected directly by the virus, um, but indirectly, our our sort of um, response to protecting those people has left her living in a condition that is very similar to a prisoner in um, solitary confinement. So she can't walk, so she doesn't go to common meals. And we could only meet her through a glass window with a microphone and speaker. Yeah. So, so, so there is something about, that, that there is a movement now in, in the UK saying actually, there must be other ways of, of doing this. And that's one of the drivers of, it, of innovation. So that's, uh, if you like, a, a little bit of your, your, your first bit. And I think um, Srinivasa's sort of interest in um, spiritual based interventions and, and, and loneliness, I, I think a lot of older people are looking for alternative ways um, of continue to have meaning in their life right um, right up to the end. Um, I think two other things struck me about what you were saying and actually partly your your um, your personal journey. So um, I have sort of research some research work which I mentioned was focused on social behavioral and design so really arts and humanities. Mm -hmm. um, and I have innovation work focused on businesses and how do businesses generate, um, and I'll call it services and products, because I want to emphasize mm. the services bit, um, that support people as they age. And I define businesses to include social enterprises, and I'll sort of yeah. come back to that. Let me sort of, firstly, our research, because, because we're trying to generate a new economy, if you like, our research is meant to be helping businesses understand the, pro the context in which they are innovating. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, we found businesses very receptive to talking to researchers. We found researchers rather more nervous about working with businesses. They're much more used to, to seeing impact from their work. Uh, certainly social scientists, I'm, I'm really referring to, much more used to seeing impact from their work through affecting public policy mm. um, and indeed when I've seen um, our, our, our current new wave of, of catalyst awards coming through the competition many of them sort of um, are from those sort of arts and humanities background and many of them sort of say when, when we're challenging them how are you going to go to impact oh I'll set up a social enterprise but they mm. haven't yet worked out that even a social enterprise needs to make a, a revenue um, to be able to build and develop its services, main, main, maintain those things. So how do we how do we get to a place where the economy is working um, in a way that actually there will be some people that will always need a safety net, but the, mm -hmm. the larger majority of people are able to access the services they want and need themselves. So, so there is a culture change in, in academia, in bits of academia. Uh, and we also think that the innovation pathway for social science sort of innovations is very different. So you mentioned India's experience with changing the patent regime. I think a lot of what we're doing isn't particularly patentable. So your, okay. your intellectual property is in, in something very different. So you have to find a different way of doing business. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I may be a little bit heretical in, in, the, in the area that I work in the UK, but 
I, I believe that we should be investing not just top down. There is a conventional sort of scientific and engineering innovation pathway that sort of says, look for cutting edge technology, back it, patent it, um, mm -hmm. uh, invest in it. Um, and you're looking for explosive hockey stick growth or something and, and, and the market mm -hmm. will take over. And in theory, then um, you, you get the sub smartphone effect that um, it enters the market as expensive as volumes grow, prices drop and it becomes more universal. Um, we're also investing bottom up. So in social enterprises mm. um, and so we're we're starting by actually investing in existing social enterprises who have an ambition to scale because because i think one of the one of the sort of investment logic issues is is why is investing something that doesn't generate a huge return a good investment well actually if if more of those in probability are going to be successful, you might actually end up with an investment logic that matches a top down investment logic where you have a very high failure rate. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also because, you know, certainly, you know, the experience of frugal innovation, a lot of that movement coming out of India, the experience of people working in communities is that that's actually where the really, really high quality innovation in aging is is happening so so there's a catalytic effect and 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 i think you know you could apply that eventually i, I would be th hoping that we would apply that across the life course so your mm -hmm. innovation could be about education it could be about um uh, child rearing right through to um living in in older age so uh, so so picking up on on actually what i think has come out of India and some some wonderful work from 50, 60 years ago um, mm -hmm. into, into how do we make this sort of a mainstream innovation pathway that, that um, people can access, complementary to the big science stuff. Right, right. No, I think I think that there are some some critical issues here and and a lot of them, you know, I mean the the, the two words that I really pick up on here are, are scale and complementarity, right? Because, because that question of, you know, um, what does it mean to, to build a bottom-up model that can scale and sustain itself? And, and I think that, that uh, certainly from what I know of Indian institutional context, one of the real challenges has been sustainability i.e. there have been lots of, you know, extraordinary institutional initiatives in a range of domains that have been pioneered by charismatic individuals, but sort of building long-term institutional roots that allow them to, to sustain, you know, beyond, beyond the charisma of, of, of particular, you know, charismatic leaders, um, individual leaders of initiatives is a challenging one. Um, is that there is this, you know, I mean, the, the two questions that come up first is, one is what is the role for the state in all of this? And, and I think that, that, you know, I mean, the US is such a, a peculiar beast from which to be thinking of these places because it's a country where, in many ways, transformative innovation in 20th century America has been underwritten almost entirely by the state. But, but there's this sort of ideology that somehow innovation happens in spite of the state or outside of the state. And, and, and that, you know, in, in most of the world, like, like if you really take that ideology seriously, then, then you end up in very choppy waters because one does need a lot of state innovation. But the problem with state innovation has always, or, or, or the problem with, with state investment is that it's often not been very good at generating sustainable revenue models in, in the long run, right? So the state is really good at, at investing and making the conditions of possibility, but has been less good at, for instance, bringing things to market. 
Mm-hmm. And so, and so that you know, there's there's an interesting question you raise about the role of the state. But the other question that I kind of want to throw in order to also, you know, um, maybe pull in some of, of 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 Srinivas's concern is, you know, what does it mean to think about an innovation problem that begins or or a question of aging that begins with the question of loneliness rather than a transcription factor right and how do we how do we kind of think those two starting points together and i think that's you know that that's a really challenging question that involves developing translational literacy of a different kind right of you know how, how do how do therapists speak to molecular biologists in order to even define the problem, let alone to solve it, for instance? Um, how, do, how do we think beyond, you know, a certain kind of, as Srinivas puts it in the chat, institutional way of organizing services in order to think about alternative ways to find meaning? One of the really interesting moves in the U.S., in some parts of the U.S. of late, and I don't know what that looks like in the U.K., is the aging at home movement. Mm-hmm. And, and that's really been about building local urban and community infrastructures to facilitate the ability for, for people to age in sustaining ways at at home, and, and I'm wondering if if those kinds of so the the, the there's certainly interest in in that sort of thing, and I'll, I'll give you an example of um something I was looking at up in the north of England in in Manchester, where um they're trying to come up with an innovation. It's very closely linked to um, the healthcare system called the Academy of Living Well, mm. which, um, which actually just think of it, um, if you were a doctor, think of it as a step down facility. Mm-hmm. But instead of being a normal step down facility, people go and live in, um, uh, live in their own you know, small apartment room where their carer comes and cooks with them does their washing with them and gets them back into their activities of daily life so so one mm-hmm. one of the problems is that we we institutionalize people very quickly and don't get them back into their home and then we make a decision that um they can't live in their home so off in, into somewhere else and you know this is a normal you know, actually th- th- these th- these are sort of normal processes of aging that people get old they get osteoporosis they fall over they break bones and things like that how do you get them back on their feet that's 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 one yeah. one example of an innovation but i think there are also other innovations around co-housing which is sort of similar yeah. so so how do you create communities um where 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 people come together um and actually there are shared facilities and things so there is a, a community and not just a place to live and another really really low level thing that, that there's a, there's another actually it's going to going to pick the same city but um uh, it, it could have happened anywhere um in manchester uh, a, a traditionally old sub area had sorry when i say old i mean the buildings the fabric were old the families had been there mm. generally um the people in the houses had got old and their youngsters had moved away what they were calling a naturally occurring retirement community, but they weren't really a community. And what they found was that by some simple innovations, um, uh, actually strategically putting um, benches along um, pavements so that so that people who could walk 200 yards but then needed a rest could actually walk the 800 yards to a shop and back. So they would breathe life back into their local shop. They would. They would actually, you know, and, and in one example, because I've previously done some work in crime, where we were removing things like mm. park benches and things where youths used to come and sit and be focused of disorder, 
Um, and they were actually saying that actually with old people sitting on the benches, they actually started to come in contact with the youths that they were scared of. And it created a different sort of dynamic. And I think, mm. I think I've, I've, I've been really inspired by some of these local initiatives where my ingoing assumption was the built environment's really expensive to do anything with. It's not possible. Yes. And yet you find that actually with some local insight, relatively small actions can have a big difference in, in the way that that community works. Yeah, yeah. And you're also therefore speaking to this then as an infrastructural problem rather than an institutional one. And Yes, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think, so the, the organisation that we work with to support our Catalyst Award holders um, called Zinc is, is a sort of mission-led um, innovation accelerator. They believe that there is value to be gained for innovators by working on major mm -hmm. problems, mental health, ageing, th things like that. If only you mm -hmm. apply more time and effort to the research and understanding what people what people want you can actually generate better innovations um, that actually are uh, will be self-sustaining and i think mm -hmm. um I, I think it's it's that it, it's that it's that the answer isn't always the state we you know famously mm -hmm. we've got a national health service most of the country think we have a national care service it's really a safety net and it isn't you know okay. most people will end up paying for their care um, mm. um, but it, but break that mentality and and say that actually you how do we actually just create places where people want to live and will live well in into older age and you know I'll, I'll come back to Srinivasa so mm -hmm. um, you know within those communities will be the groups where people meet um, whether it's by a specific um, religious denomination or, or or for some other spiritual purpose. Actually, my wife teaches Tai Chi um, as a physio for, for older people. I actually find people attend the classes probably as much to talk to other people as they do to actually do the exercise. Mm. So, so all of that sort of infrastructure actually needs people to want to come out of wherever they're living and, and, and engage. Which, which then leads to a different kind of policy question, which is how does one build capacity for that kind of infrastructure? Because that's not then just a technological infrastructure, it's also a policy infrastructure. Uh, yes, and, and I, you know, one of the things that I sort of say, you know, so aging in the UK um, disproportionately impacts on women. Um, mm. So more of them are going to live longer and m many more of them arrive in later life with fewer resources because they've yeah. taken on caring responsibilities or, 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 or other things um, in their life. So, so there are specific you know, um, groups that we need to sort of stop, stop and think about. And how, you know, how do you address that? Well, one, one of the areas I'm... I'm I, I've been very influenced by Professor Sir Andrew Scott and Professor Linda Grattan's book, The Hundred Year Life. Mm -hmm. um, because Andrew and, and Linda would sort of say, well, look, we've got a retirement age that was fixed long before we started living this long. And we have some okay. societal automatic off switch that says, right, you're 65 or 67, whatever it is where, you, where you're living. Now, you know, enter the third stage and you've got probably as much as your working life ahead of you. Um, but now arriving at, at that stage in much better condition and not really ready to stop work in all its forms that can be volunteering, it can be paid work. So how do we, you know, part of this is how do we, how do we adapt um, what we do and how do we adapt our society to take advantage of the wonderful thing that is actually longer lives. Right. And that, 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 so there is a policy question there, and it's yeah. not about paying for it directly, but it is actually setting up, if you like, the, the infrastructure that allows mm. us to think about um, yeah. being active for much longer. 
Right. And, and an enabling environment. And yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, Michelle, um, I'm... Yeah, please. Sorry, go on. Yes. I was just telling Michelle I'm mindful of time, so she should tell us to, to stop whenever she wants to, but please go, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I just, um, this this session technically ends at 11.20, but um, okay. Oh, okay. Free, I mean, really feel okay. free to continue discussing. I've enjoyed listening to you both. Um, and apologies that there were not additional folks that joined, but um, yeah, so feel free to, mm. to uh, continue. Please. No, I was just um, gosh, we've probably come come to a pause there, but I, I, mm. I I've really enjoyed this because I think you've you know I was I was looking at the research that you've done and and it, it does sort of point out how big business actually has very particular interests that that actually uh, you know may not. We'll need channeling in some ways, so that so that we get the best effect from from what they're doing. While they they have to do what they do, which is which is generate sort of uh, you know good good business. Um, yeah. Interestingly, in in the UK, we've just formed a new um, movement called Business for Health, and and mm. looking to um, work with our industry associations and and leading employers in thinking about. Um, health in so many things, health for their workforce, um, the health impact of the products and services that they offer out there, but, but also their mm -hmm. role, their role, um, particularly for those that are anchor institutions in, in larger mm -hmm. communities, what more mm -hmm. are they doing? So trying to sort of move the business agenda um, for us, you know, now, now the investor community, we call it ESG, so, um, env environment, social and, and governance sort of responsibilities. Mm. We're trying to put H and the, the health in there as well. Um, so, that, so that it's not just the bottom line numbers that people are looking at. It's actually you know, the, the overall responsibility of a business. Uh, and I think mm -hmm. the, environment, mm -hmm. the environmental movement has shown us how this can be done um, right. and how it can change behaviors. And, and, and I think we need the same sort of thing to think about aging healthily as well. Mm, mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, this this is this is all this has been very interesting for me as well. So th thank you. Thank you for that for that perspective. And uh I'm thinking about, you know, I mean thinking about how some of these specifically materialize in different in different national contexts, which are also different governance contexts, is a is a very interesting question. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so and I, I I tell you, I've worked in healthcare systems in the UK, um, elsewhere in Europe, uh, in the US, and and in the Middle East. Um, mm. The one thing that working in in some of the Gulf states has really taught me was that all the money in the world still doesn't give you a good health system. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. Um, and it's you know it's and that that leads on to sort of what we're doing that you if you expect it to be solved by someone else, mm -hmm. um, it, it will always be a problem that is ultimately insoluble um, so a, a, a former sort of leader of our health system um, picked up a, a phrase from um, Africa and I'm going to try and remember it but but uh, health is made at home hospitals are for repairs <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah yeah um, and and trying to get that health is made at home philosophy really built into um, everything we're doing, I think, is 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 part of this, and and is a is a big societal and behavioural change issue. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And